Good evening, and thank you, Mr. Sakurai. Uh, on behalf of the Sake Export Association, I would like to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, as Mr. Sakurai pointed out, this is the 19th year we've done this. Next year will be the 20th year, which is a huge uh, milestone. Uh, also, on behalf of the brewers of the Sake Export Association, I'd like to thank the Japan Society for patiently working with us uh, over the past 19 years to make this program a reality. Uh, tonight's uh, topic is going to be uh, sake regionality and terroir. Uh, originally, I think in the material that was distributed to everybody and in the public announcements of the event, it just talked about sake regionality. But as I start, started to write the uh, presentation out, uh, the concept of terroir comes up again and again, and I'm often asked about it. Uh, how does it apply to sake? So I kind of, uh, without permission, put that in <laughs> to the presentation and into the title as well. So those are the two things uh, that I want to be talking about tonight. And they're very tightly related, so. Uh, eh, the first thing uh, to talk about is does sake really have regionality? I mean, is this a concept that we can talk about? Uh, and Japan's got a great sense of region with respect to all things. In other words, every region has something they're famous for. Every region's got a great noodle, or a great cake, or a great sake, uh, at least a great sake, or even great knives, or great, great clothing, or something. Every region in Japan has something for which it's, it's famous. And every famous thing has a region for which it, it comes from. In other words, it kind of works both ways. Every cake has a place where it's made the best and things like that. So sake's got a great sense of regionality, and that definitely applies to sake as well. Uh, but talking about sake regionality, what do I really mean by that? Well, if we look at the prefectures of Japan, and everyone does have a copy of this map and the material that was distributed to it. I'll refer to it several times throughout the evening. But what I mean by regionality is, does sake from one part of the country taste like this, and sake from another part of the country taste like this? Do the various regions or the various prefectures uh, have styles, sweet, dry, aromatic, something like that, that can be associated uh, with them? Uh, by the way, Japan has uh, 47 prefectures. Each one is about the size of a county and just as politically autonomous for what that's worth. And the answer to the question is yes, sake does have regionality. It definitely has regionality to it. But it's really not quite uh, like it is in the wine world. It's not nearly as clearly delineated nor as expressed uh, in the wine world as it is in the wine world. Uh, to me, and this is an arguable point, I guess. In many ways, sake is not nearly as bold as wine is. It doesn't have the same presence. Uh, to me, sake is much more restrained, uh, very often subtle, and much more vague. And I think the concept of regionality is like that. These terms apply to, this concept applies to regionality in sake as well. In other words, it does exist, but it's much more vague and subtle than it might be as it's expressed uh, in, the, in the wine world. If you were to look at the 47 prefectures in Japan, admittedly, not every single one has a style that can be associated with. Every single prefecture makes at least some very good sake, uh, but not necessarily uh, has a style that can be associated with all the sake in that region. There's some that are just good, but amongst those good breweries, some are sweet, some are dry, some are rich, some are aromatic. Uh, so there are breweries where it's all mixed up, but in my mind, if you were to look at all the prefectures in Japan, probably about 60% of them have a style that could be associated with them to some degree. Uh, and 60% is a passing grade. Uh, furthermore, if you were to look at the prefectures in Japan that do have uh, styles of sake that can be associated with them, not every single brewery in those prefectures will conform to that style. So for example, if we have a prefecture with very light and dry sake, not every single prefecture in that, sorry, not every single brewery in that prefecture will make a sake that conforms to that style. There might be some that don't conform to the style. But in my mind, 60% to 70% of the breweries of the kura in each of these regions that do have a style associated, associated with them will conform to that regional style. So without a doubt, we do have uh, regionality to sake. It's definitely got a passing grade uh, when it comes to that. So why don't we look, what I'd like to look at now is what contributes to regionality. What, in those prefectures that do have a style that can be associated with them, what contributes to that? And the first and most obvious uh, example of what gives a sake of a particular region a style to it is going to be the raw materials, namely rice and water. Uh, if we look at rice in particular, when regional styles developed in Japan, this wasn't like in the 1990s, it was like in the 1700s and 1800s. So way back then, of course, they used local rice. Uh, you can ship rice in from other regions. We'll come back to that point in a moment. But uh, of course, a long time ago, that wasn't practically possible for a number of reasons. And 
So brewers, of course, used the rice that was local to them. Uh, and that contributed a lot to the regionality, to the style of the various sakes. In other words, rice is the main ingredient, and that will contribute to what the sake tastes like. And so if you're limited to using this rice in your region, that's going to affect what your sake will taste like and the sake of the entire region. Uh, water to a certain degree, and we'll come back to this in great depth uh, later in the presentation. However, if you look at water, not every region is like this, but if you have regions that have soft water throughout them, you're going to have a particular style, a fairly absorbing style to the sake made in that region. Conversely, if you have sake, if you have regions that have a lot of hard water in the regions, that will then affect the sake of those uh, of that region as well. So rice and water both affect the regionality, the way that a sake, the sakes of a particular region will taste and smell. Climate is another one, and climate is a big one, actually. Uh, if you look at Japan, it is a very long northeast to southwest country, and obviously the northern prefectures are quite cold and the southern prefectures are quite warm. Uh, fermentation of temperature, uh, temperature fermentation really has a lot to do with the nature of a sake. Uh, if you enjoy beer as well, you probably are aware that the difference between lagers and, and ales are the difference at which it was fermented. Uh, lagers are fermented at a colder temperature. You get a much cleaner, crisper flavor profile. Ales, ales are much broader because they're fermented at a higher temperature, among other things. And sake is the same way. In the northern part of Japan, where they're fermenting at lower temperatures, you're getting much cleaner, crisper flavor profiles. The farther southwest you go, you're fermenting at, uh, at higher temperatures. And so you get bigger, broader flavors from that part of the country. Uh, not only fermentation, but storage. Most sake is stored for about six months to a year after brewed and before shipping. Not all, but most. And if you're storing at a warmer temperature, it's the same thing. You're going to get much richer flavors coming out of that than if you're storing at a colder temperature. So the amb ambient temperatures of regions would contribute to the regionality of sake as well. Further is cuisine, uh, very interestingly and not surprisingly. I mean, sake profiles developed with the food that people were eating locally. If you look at Japan's terrain, it's a very long country. And you've got a lot of mountains running down the middle. Uh, hundreds of years ago, when these profiles developed, the people living in the mountains pretty much uh, ate a lot of preserved food because you can't get raw materials up there too easily. I mean, you would have salty, rich, fairly strong flavored food. And the sake that developed in those regions developed flavor profiles that went along with the food there. Uh, conversely, if you went down around near the coasts, especially around fishing ports, you've got tons of fresh fish coming in on a daily basis. And so the sake that developed down around the ocean side developed to go well with uh, fresh fish. I mean, whoopsie daisy, that was too fast. Um, developed with, uh, so that people could enjoy that with fresh sashimi and other lighter fish. Uh, between the mountains and the ocean, you've got plains. In plains, you've got roads. And roads allow raw materials, including fruit and uh, vegetables and fish and meat, all of those, to move quickly. So you can get fresher materials to people a lot more quickly. And therefore, the socket profiles in those plain areas uh, develop partly uh, in tune with that, what people were eating because of what they could get on a fairly regular basis. So the traditional cuisine of the various regions of Japan had a lot to do with development of the flavor profiles uh, as well. Uh, lastly is Toji. Toji is a master brewer. And obviously, the guy in charge or the woman in charge making the sake would have a great influence on how that sake turns out. Uh, these days, it's not as strong an influence as it was, again, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. But back in the day, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, there were various groups of toji, various guilds of these master brewers in particular regions that would send their members out to all of the breweries in that region. And everything, they all did it to a particular style. Now, everybody around the country was brewing sake, but they all had their own tricks of the trade, their own secrets to develop different styles of sake. So the toji... Uh, of the particular regions had a lot to do with developing the regional styles uh, as well. That's definitely actually a big one, at least historically and traditionally. Those are the things that contribute to regionality. There's a number of things that detract from regionality uh, as well, and I'd like to talk about those uh, for a while as well. Uh, number one is the fact that rice can be shipped legally all over the country. In other words, practically and legally, it's not a problem to ship rice from the place where it was grown to other places in the country. Uh, although this is a debatable point, uh, the best sake rice comes from particular regions in Japan. And there are brewers all over the country that will use the best sake from the best regions for the top grades of sake. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this legally or practically. It uh, happens on a daily basis. Admittedly, uh, there are brewers that are trying more and more to use local sake as much as possible. But the point is that the fact that rice, your raw materials can be shipped all over the country, and that's really a big chink in the armor 
of the concept of regionality. I mean, this is a local product, but the raw materials are from somewhere else. Uh, so the fact that rice can be shipped attracts from regionality for sure. Next is changes in culinary lifestyle. Uh, I assure you that the people in the mountains these days, if they want to, can get fresh, fresh sashimi on pretty much a daily basis with a quick uh, car ride to the local store. Uh, and Japanese people are eating a lot more things than what they were eating 100 years ago. There's just Their diet has changed. Their culinary lifestyle has changed quite a bit. And so the sake they prefer to enjoy with that has changed quite a bit as well. Uh, next is technology, uh, climate control. For example, if you want to ferment at a particular temperature, these days it doesn't matter how hot or cold it is outside. You can just re refrigerate the whole fermentation room. Uh, you can refrigerate individual tanks if you want to. So you can really... Uh, exert a lot of influence over the climate these days, which is something that you couldn't do uh, before. Furthermore, uh, in the old days, 100 years ago or so, all of the secrets were with the toji. Those skills, the, the brewing methods, uh, were all up here in the toji's minds. These days, you can learn how to brew sake from the internet if you want to. Not really, but the point is there's books, there's reports, there's classes. Uh, it's really easy for uh, someone who wants to learn how to brew sake professionally to be able to do that. Uh, and as such, uh, I would say that sake brewing is getting a bit homogenized. I'm not necessarily criticizing, but the point is the influence of the old guilds of Toji isn't nearly as strong as it might have been in the past, and this takes away from re regionality as well. A couple more things that are interesting in my mind that take away from regionality is the convergence of Ginjo styles. You may recall that Ginjo has only been a viable product on the market for about 30 years. Uh, and as Ginjo develops, Ginjo is very light, very elegant, very refined, and to me, Ginjo styles start to converge and taste more and more like Ginjo than they did the original styles. They get much more refined and kind of converge as a flavor profile, as a style of sake. Um, if I want to taste regionality in a sake, I don't drink the trap grades. I drink the lower grades, and I put that in quotes simply because uh, it's just a matter of preference. But the higher you go into the Ginjo realms, the more you'll taste well, refined fruity sake, but less of the original, original regions. Uh, so that kind of takes away from, as good as it is, it takes away from uh, regionality as well. Uh, next is modern, uh, modern market and infrastructure. And what I mean by that is uh, the market for any given sake brewery today is not the local people anymore. It's the entire country and sometimes the whole world. So they've had to adjust their flavor profiles to appeal to much more than just the local people. One brewery from the boonies in Akita Prefecture uh, once told me that their entire customer base 20 years ago could be serviced by a four-hour ride in a pickup truck from the brewery. That was it. They sold all of their sake within a four-hour drive radius. These days, their sake is sold in Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, New York, and all over the world. So they've chosen to. I wouldn't say they had to. Some don't. But they've chosen to adjust their styles and make it much more appealing to a larger market. Uh, tied in with this is the infrastructure. And again, what I mean by this is I live in a city called Kamakura, about an hour south of Tokyo. I can get on the internet and I can order sake, probably any sake brewery all over Japan, and have it shipped to me. So the market is pretty much seamless anymore. I mean, your market is anybody anywhere, and you need to create sake that appeals to anybody uh, anywhere, and that affects the original style of your sake for sure. Next is there's no laws in Japan about uh, confining, confining? Uh, restricting production methods or raw materials to put the name of a particular region on the bottle. In other words, brewers aren't Restri uh, restricted to using a particular rice in a particular region or brewing in a particular method or way. Uh, they're free to brew sake with any rice they want and in any way they want. And so that never really allowed regionality to develop the same way as it might have uh, in the wine world. So these are some of the things that detract from regionality. Now, regionality to me is still a very, very, very interesting study. Admittedly, it's vague. It's, it's uh, kind of subtle and vague, but I really do enjoy studying it myself. And to me, this is a great rule of thumb. Something you can put in your back pocket and, uh, and walk away with and go drink sake and kind of apply it. You can apply it tonight when we end up tasting. Uh, this is the map that everybody does have. And again, if you look at it from, you can see how Japan runs northeast to southwest. Um, and the general rule of thumb that I would pass on is the farther northeast you go, the more light, the more fine-grained, which is the term I like, uh, the more delicate the sake gets, uh, the more compact the flavor gets when you go farther. And again, there's a lot of reasons for this. The rice that was available 100 years ago, uh, the skill of the brewers up there, uh, and the, of course the temperatures. Um, the farther southwest you go, the more rich, the more big bone, the more earthy, the broader the flavors get. 
There are those that say the farther northeast you go, the drier it gets, and the farther southwest you go, the sweeter it gets. To me, that's not correct. That's going too far in this general rule of thumb. But I do think light, fine grain, delicate up north, and then southwest. when you go southwest, you get rich, more big bone, earthy, broad flavors. Uh, and to me, that's a really easy uh, way to remember regionality and to start to learn about it as well. Uh, however, and this is again what makes sake interesting, is the many exceptions that apply to every uh, stage, everything we talk about. There's many exceptions to this progression. For example, if you were to start here in the northeast corner and start to work south, you would generally get ever fattening, ever richer flavor profiles. But here and there, you're going to get a prefecture that doesn't conform to that progression at all. Uh, there could be a million reasons for that. Uh, when they started brewing, who was affecting their brewing. Uh, a million reasons could apply, but there's a lot of breweries that really don't follow this progression. Uh, so it's there, but there's exceptions to it, and that kind of makes it interesting uh, to me as well. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about the major brewing regions in Japan and a very little bit about each one of the flavor profiles. Uh, if you were to look at this map, you might be able to follow it a bit more closely, although you can study it at your leisure at any time. The largest producing region is in Hyogo Prefecture. If you looked on the map, the red box in the bottom that says Kansai, if you were to go up from the upper left-hand corner of that, you'll see Hyogo Prefecture. Uh, about 35% of all sake produced in the universe comes out of this particular prefecture. Within that prefecture is the city of Kobe, and within the city of Kobe, and straddling another city called Nishinomiya, is a neighborhood called Nada. And Nada is the brewing capital of the universe. Uh, most of the sake, more sake comes out of that neighborhood than any other place uh, in Japan, in the world, and therefore the universe. Sake from that region tends to be fairly dry and simple and straightforward. You don't get ostentatious aromatic sake coming out of this particular region. The number two brewing region is in the city of Kyoto. Uh, and again, the, city of, uh, the prefecture of Kyoto is actually right next to the uh, prefecture of Hyogo, if you wanted to find that. And although they're right next to each other, they have completely different styles. Mainly, that's a function of the water. Nada has very hard water, whereas Fushimi tends to have softer water. Whoops, going the wrong way here. Uh, Fushimi tends to have softer water. So you get much fuller, richer, drier sake in, in Hyogo. You go over to Kyoto, you get much more soft, absorbing sake. Um, and a lot has to, of that has to do with the very refined cuisine of Kyoto as well. And Kyoto, again, is the number two brewing region uh, in Japan. Third is Niigata Prefecture. And Niigata, if you look at it from the top of the main island on the inside, on the left side, uh, in green type, it's the second prefecture labeled down, Niigata Prefecture. Uh, Niigata has a very, very high reputation uh, in the industry for brewing great sake from long, long back, and a very clearly identifiable style. They call it tande karakuchi, very light and dry and refined. Um, and I would say probably more than any other prefecture, almost every brewery in that region conforms to this style. So it's a very clearly defined style there. And on top of that, they're the number th three producer uh, in Japan. Number fourth is Akita Prefecture. And again, if you look at the map, it is in the upper left-hand corner of the main island. Uh, Akita Prefecture is very typical of the whole northeastern Tohoku region. Uh, a lot of flavor, but it's kind of compacted in, very delicate, striated, kind of fine grain sake uh, coming from that uh, particular region. Uh, the, uh, the next one is Hiroshima Prefecture, which is uh, on the southern part of the main island of Japan. If you go down where it says Chugoku in purple and go a little bit to the lower right of that, you'll see Hiroshima Prefecture. They have very soft water down there, and a lot of the sake tends to be very sweet. Uh, not all of it, uh, but most of it uh, is, is, is on the sweet side from that particular region. But the most defining thing is, is the soft water that comes from that region. Lastly, we've got Fukushima Prefecture. And if you look on the right side of the main island, uh, where it says Tohoku in gold letters, two below that is where Fukushima Prefecture is. And Fukushima is interesting because it has mountains, plains, and the ocean. So they've got a lot of different styles within this particular region. Uh, the last thing I want to say about regionality, or at least the main brewing regions, the six I've listed here are the top six historically and traditionally. In actuality, these days, there's a couple of less historically significant prefectures that have been producing a lot of inexpensive sake lately. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's great. So if you look at the actual numbers of production, uh, at number three and at number five, a couple of other prefectures come into the list. Uh, but historically, traditionally, culturally speaking, these were the main brewing regions of Japan. And they pretty much held this rank for, for the most part, uh, for many, many decades and many, many years. Uh, I'd like to move on from the uh, regionality of sake and talk a little bit more about the terroir of sake. 
Uh, and to me, to begin with, the definition of the word terroir is very, very hard to nail down. If you like this kind of thing and poke around on the internet, you'll find lots of definitions with, about terroir as it applies to wine. What you won't find is a consensus uh, on how it should be defined. Uh, and so I looked up a couple of things and found a couple of definitions that I thought would apply well to the discussion tonight, uh, and I've chosen to borrow them. And there's two definitions that I want to look at and compare before we talk about what contributes to the terroir of sake and what does not. Uh, the first one is the complete natural environment in which a particular sake is produced, including factors such as the soil, topography, and climate. Uh, this is more difficult to apply to sake, I think, because as we mentioned very often, the rice is brought in from elsewhere. So the soil, the topography, and the climate affects the rice, but the rice not, might not be from the region in which the sake is brewed. Uh, the one below it, however, I think is a bit more applicable. The characteristic taste and flavor imparted to a wine, uh, I'm sorry, to a sake, by the environment in which it is produced. And to me, the environment means not just the ambient uh, temperature and weather and things around that, but the environment of the brewery itself. And I think that's really where we find the terroir of sake most clearly expressed, or where it actually is sourced, I should say. So why don't we uh, look at some things here. To me, when I, when I want to apply this term to sake, it's what is it that makes the sake of one brewery something that is tied to that place, uh, and something that basically cannot be replicated anywhere else? Uh, this is a good definition, I think. It's kind of a fingerprint uh, that can be identified with a sake that ties it to a particular brewery. Um, Again, this is not a really strict definition. To say any one sake here could never be replicated any, anywhere else would be, would be uh, an exaggeration. But most breweries make a style that's really difficult to take the same rice and the same water and try to do the same thing elsewhere. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that, but that's the way I'd like to look at now. What makes one sake unique to a particular brewery, if not a region and if not a, a neighborhood? Uh, and the first topic is rice. Uh, again, rice is the main raw material of sake. And long, long ago, they used rice grown very close to the brewery. Uh, as we spoke of a couple of times now, rice can be shipped all over Japan, so you're not limited by any stretch of the imagination to lose sake, use rice that grows in the neighborhood of the brewery. However, there are a handful of breweries that do that. There's a couple of breweries that will only use rice within, for example, a six-mile radius of the brewery. Uh, there's also a couple of breweries that will go so far as to only grow the rice in fields where the water that sources, where that, that rises up and, and, and uh, feeds the rice plants is the same water that they make their sake with. To me, which is a really interesting thing to do. It's kind of a, a domain concept there. Uh, and I also think a lot of brewers, the industry overall, is moving more and more towards using local rice as much as possible. Certainly the top grades of sake will always be made with the top grades of sake rice, but more and more brewers are moving closer to or more toward using local rice. So if the rice is locally harvested, certainly this is a part of the terroir of sake. Next is water. And I have to say, perhaps. <laughs> uh, I've heard people say that water is really the terroir of sake because you can't move it. It's tied to that particular brewery. Uh, so I can't really agree with that statement. However, I can't really totally disagree with it either. So let's look at that for a minute or two. Um, number one, water is almost always coming from wells in sake breweries. Uh, and the wells can be anywhere from 30 feet to hundreds of feet deep. But the wells don't care what's going on in the surface. They have nothing to do with what's going around in the immediate environment of the brewery. They're unaffected by the weather. They're unaffected by what grows there. Uh, they're unaffected by anything taking place uh, above ground. So that's not really tying a sake to a particular region when the water's coming from hundreds of feet underground. Uh, another thing is, really, the water that comes up in my well was sourced from a mountain range. It could be tens of miles away, it could be hundreds of miles away. But this water tied to this land actually comes from mountains far, far away where the snow melted through the mountains and over decades the water seeped over and filled up wells here. Uh, so it's not really tied to this place if you look at it that way. Uh, furthermore, the source of water underneath my brewery is probably underneath the guy next door to me's brewery as well. So yeah, while it may tie my sake to this region, it ties his sake to the same region as well. Uh, so it's kind of difficult to consider that something that contributes to a fingerprint of the, uh, of the, of the, of the, uh, the sake to my, uh, in, my, in a particular brewery. Uh, on top of that, any one plot of land, if you dig down, you'll hit one water table. Great. If you dig down deeper, you'll hit another water table. You might have four or five or more different sources of water on one plot of land. So to say this water is what makes my sake what it is because it's tied to my land, well, it is, but so are four or five other sources of water uh, as well. So uh, 
And then the last thing, people say, well, water might be what defines the regionality, the fingerprint, the terroir of sake, because you can't bring it in from anywhere else, when actually you can. Uh, it does not happen very often, but there are breweries where the well dried up, for example, and they've got to bring in the water from somewhere else. They might pipe it in, they might send a, a truck to fill it up every day and bring it back, which is very labor intensive, but it does happen. Not too many breweries do this, but it is something that's impossible. I'm sorry, it is something that's not impossible. So sometimes you can have the water brought in. So to me, water is not a bad definition, but it's got its limitations if you want to uh, use it to identify the particular terroir of a sake. Um, next is the master brewer, to some degree. Uh, and again, this is an interesting conversation because a master brewer will have a traditional style. A toji will have a traditional style that he'll do things, or she will do things. Um, and certainly that contributes to the regionality of sake and the terroir of sake. That makes it unique to a certain degree. Uh, however, these days, I mean, any master brewer, if you leave him or her to their own devices, they'll make sake in a particular way. Uh, but they can do anything they want with proper education and with proper experience. So the owner of the brewery might come in and say, look, uh, I know you like to make rich, heavy sake, but I need something sweet and light. And the master brewer will say, sure, I can take care of that. So when you consider whether or not the toji, the toji is actually influencing the terroir of a particular brewery, to a certain degree, he or she is, but if he or she does what the president tells them to do, then it's kind of not what they would naturally do. Uh, and therefore, that kind of weakens, I think, the link to that as well. Uh, another interesting one is the ambient microorganisms. And, and every brewery is going to have wild yeast in there. And although they almost always use cultured yeast, the wild yeast will certainly affect things to a certain degree. Uh, lactic bacteria might be floating around too. Uh, or all kinds of microorganisms will affect how well a sake is brewed. And every brewery will make adjustments to work with whatever is in their air. So it's never going to be a showstopper. That's never going to really make the sake taste real bad. But the unique microorganisms living in every brewery certainly, I think, give that sake to that brewery a unique touch, something that can't really be reproduced elsewhere. Uh, another one is the physical conditions of the brewery. And again, local climate. We've talked about this before. If the brewery is located in a very cold place, that's going to affect it as well and identify it and tie it very closely to that particular place. Um, Another one is the physical conditions of the brewery, including the preferred methods of brewing and the aim for style. So in other words, if a brewery, no matter where they are, likes to make very gamey sake, that's going to be a part of their identity, a part of what ties them to that particular brewery. Uh, if they make light and fruity sake, again, as a rule, if that's the style of sake they make, if that's what they aim for, that's going to identify them and make them unique from any other brewery and make it difficult to reproduce that uh, elsewhere. Uh, next is the physical conditions of the brewery. I say coulda, but same thing, brewery, uh, including the equipment used and its limitations. And again, this is interesting to me. Sake can be made very much by hand. Uh, and almost always, the best sake is made by hand. But really, everybody uses machines to at least some degree. Machines sometimes can do a better job than humans. Machines are not necessarily a bad thing. Often they can save massive labor uh, and be worth the trade-off. Uh, but every machine's got its limitations. So the kind of machines or machine, machine or machines that a brewery might have in there, how many they have, what they do, what their limitations are, will contribute to making that sake unique and something that's really not reproducible anywhere else and be a part of the uh, perceived terroir uh, of sake. Uh, to me, the concept of the limitations of machines is very interesting. Uh, the picture we have here on the left is a sake press. Basically, when it's fermented, you put it into this big accordion-like machine and you squeeze it down with the plates, and that makes the sake come out and leaves the rice particles behind. Now, the picture on the left are panels. Uh, and the more panels you have in there, the bigger batch you can press. But the panels are cheap. They're like $5,000 each. So a brewer is kind of limited in the size of his, his or her batch based on how many of these panels, how big your machine is. This is just one example. Every single step of the process has limitations to it, and those limitations will affect everything else. So if you're limited by how much you can press at one time, that limits your batch size, which limits everything else you do in the brewery, which very much defines what your terroir will be, what your unique fingerprint will be that makes your sake uh, not reproducible uh, anywhere else. Uh, and then there's more to this, the physical conditions of the brewery, uh, including the number of tanks, the batch sizes, and, and, and uh, the layout of the brewery. For example, um, if you can have very small tanks and make about a ton of rice at a time, which is typical for premium sake. You can make five, six, nine tons at a time if you want to, and it'll be ha have to be handled a completely different way. Neither one is intrinsically better than the other, but it's all handled in a different way that's going to give you, or the brewer, uh, a unique style that makes it difficult to reproduce in any other brewery. 
Uh, the uh, size of the batch as well, as I mentioned. Oh, and the number of tanks you have. For example, um, if Ginjo sake, premium sake, takes about a month to ferment. If you want to start a batch every single day, you have to have 30 tanks because it'll be another month before the first tank opens up again. Uh, if you don't have the space for that or the people to work that, you have less tanks, all of that combines to form uh, a fingerprint, something that makes your sake unique and not something that could be made uh, elsewhere. Then, most interestingly to me, is a lot of unseen factors that are out there. Um, there's a lot of uh, factors that are not scientifically, don't have anything scientific grounding in them that will make uh, a, bre a brewery uh, sake unique and not something that can be made elsewhere. One of the most interesting examples I met, I, I remember, is a brewery I visited, I don't know, a long time ago, they had one tank of sake fermenting in a really odd place. The tank was like in the middle of an aisle. I mean, you couldn't get the forklift around it. It was just in the way. And I asked them why they did that. And they said, well, for some reason, every year, our best sake comes from this tank. We moved the tank, and the sake got worse. We moved it back, and the sake got better. It says, something, the wind just blows differently here. But all we know is it's when it's here, and there's no scientific proof for why it is, when it's here, it tastes better. Every single brewery has things like that, things that have no concrete grounding, but they know to be true to their experience. So this is another thing that will make sake unique and not reproducible uh, elsewhere. So to me, the terroir of sake is this. It's all the things that combine to make the sake of one particular kura something that cannot be replicated elsewhere. Um, as I pointed out, it, it is very real, and it's very, very interesting to study, but it's certainly much more vague uh, and subtle, I think, than the concept is uh, when it's applied to uh, the wine world. Um, this is all very interesting. Regionality and terroir of sake is very, very interesting. Um, but uh, I think, in truth, it's very interesting, but it's secondary uh, to enjoying a sake for what it is. Uh, if you enjoy the sake of a particular brewery, by all means, pursue that. If you enjoy the sake of a particular region, by all means, pursue that region. It'll probably lead you to other regions. Uh, you may find studying regionality and the terroir of sake uh, is very, very interesting, but I think uh, it's secondary to just enjoying the sake in front of you for, the, uh, for what it is. There's nothing really, no reason to go beyond that. That's plenty uh, of all the studying that you could do. Um, what's really good tonight is we've got, I believe, 11 breweries and several sake from each one of them. And if you were to go from number one down to number 14, you would be going from northeast to southwest. Now, if everybody did that particular circuit, <laughs> it'd get pretty crowded. Uh, however, if you pay attention to where on that northeast to southwest line it is, uh, you can actually kind of experience this yourself as you do, as you do the tasting later on. <laughs> with no further ado, with no further ado, so that the brewers can get, get back and get ready for the coming onslaught of sake fans, and so that that group of fans can get back there fairly early, uh, I'd like to introduce one, each one of the brewers that are here today from the Sake Export Association. There are some uh, that aren't here today, but I'll introduce the ones that are. From Hokkaido, uh, the brewers of Takasago Sake, representing tonight is Mizi Shiguro. <laughs> From Akita Prefecture, brewing a sake called Yamato, Yamato, Yamato Shizuku is Mr. Ito. <laughs> From Iwate Prefecture, brewing, representing the company that brews Nambu Bijin, <clears throat> Nambu Bijin is, is Ms. Minakawa. <clears throat> From Miyagi Prefecture, brewing Hoyo Sake is Mr. Uchigasaki. <clears throat> From Niigata Prefecture, brewing Kambara Sake and Kirin Sake, we have Mr. Sato. <clears throat> From from Fukushima Prefecture Brewing Okunomatsu Sake, we have Mr. Yusa. From Tochigi Prefecture Brewing Tentaka Sake, we have Mr. Ozaki. From Ishikawa Prefecture Brewing the Sake Yuho, we have Ms. Fujita. From Fukui Prefecture Brewing Hanagaki Sake, we have Mr. Nambu. From Okayama Prefecture, brewing the sake called Chikurin, we have Mr. Marumoto. From Hiroshima Prefecture, brewing Fukucho sake, we have Ms. Imada. From Shimane Prefecture, brewing, ri, brewing Rihaku sake, we have Mr. Tanaka. From Yamaguchi Prefecture, representing Dasai sake, we have Mr. Tabendera. 
and from uh, Saga Prefecture, <laughs> every year I screw one thing up. <laughs> from Saga Prefecture Brewing, uh, Shichida Sake, we have Mr. Shichida. Each brewery has two or three sake for everybody to enjoy. They're gonna go prepare for that right now. So we have one more round of applause for them as they leave the stage. Okay. Okay. 